Let's all join together and pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts here be pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock. You are our redeemer. Amen. You and I are so blessed that it really is easy to forget. I made it a goal and set aside time this week to slow down and think through the blessings that I have in a normal week like this one, just to try to be more aware and more appreciative for the blessings that God has given. But if I'm being honest, that was really hard this week. Because I get woken up in the morning by two of my sweet little girls and then we go and we play in their room until the sun comes out and is bright outside. Then I go to our cabinets and I pack little bags full of snacks for them, first breakfast for them. We put them in the back of the bike trailer. I get them into the bike trailer and then I get to go on a bike ride with them around our neighborhood for like a half an hour. I come back home, and most mornings I get to see my wife snuggling my little nine-month-old daughter who smiles at me for our first interaction. I make breakfast, and uh, most of the days of the week, I make breakfast from the food that we have, which is not like food for a meal or a day, but probably for like weeks or even months. That's always there in our house, too. And that? Those blessings, that's just up to 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> Trying to be more aware of the blessings that we have in 21st century America, I think that's a challenge worthy of everything that we've got to give. Because after not too long of trying to be intentional and do this, you start to realize just how blessed you are that you and I have clean water to drink, unlike a third of the world today trying to get water. That you and I can't remember the last time that we didn't go without a meal when you weren't sick or forced to in the field. That you have multiple cars in your driveway right now that can take you anywhere, anytime you want to get there, and, and they're going to be safe for you to drive, actually. Even if you haven't been blessed with all of that kind of stuff in your life, if you try and count all the blessings you have, you are going to find there's so much more than you can even hold in your head just for a couple minutes. I think that's why this is one of, if not the biggest temptation that we're going to have in our lives. It's a focus on the things here and now, the things in this world only. We've got so much that we even take the big things for granted. The house, the food, the clothes, family and friends, we take those blessings for granted. Like they're always going to be there. Like we actually can feel justified daring to complain about the traffic that it takes us when we're going somewhere or how it's too hot outside but not too hot inside our buildings or inside our cars either. Yeah, you and I love this pile of blessings. God has given us so much that let's be honest, the devil doesn't even have to be creative anymore. It is an easy strategy against us, and it works pretty well. So that you and I, though, do not go unprepared through these things, today we got to look at the last part of what it means to come to Jesus. Yes, you get to bring all of the messiness and pain and hurt Yes, you, Jesus, still wants you come to him. Yes, you still, you get to take all the good things that Jesus has for you. All those blessings, all that good grace, that undeserved love, you get to take it. You get to take all of that in for yourself. But there is one more thing about life with Jesus. Sometimes you need to leave it. Not for a few minutes or hours or days. Sometimes in life there are things you need to drop and walk away from and never go back to them again. Because when you're following behind Jesus, 
you cannot have your arms heavy and full of the things of this world. You're going to need them to hold on to something else that he wants to give you. Don't believe me yet? Imagine that on your way here, you got a flat tire. And you made it here and the car rolled in and it was okay, but you're not getting anywhere else or not too far at least until you get that thing replaced. So how long, logistically right now, how long would it take you before you'd get a new one? Some of you, by this point, by the time you're sitting inside of here, some of you would know exactly the place and the time and the person, and within a few hours, it'd probably be done. Others of you, maybe as you're sitting here in this room, AAA would be out there putting the new tire on your car so that even while you're here, you wouldn't even have to wait a moment to go anywhere else. Hours after what looks like it could be a disaster for a car, you and I in 21st century America, you can find a way to fix it so easily that life, even with something as big as that, life doesn't stop at all. It just keeps looking normal. Because the truth is, you and I today, we live in a want it, need it, got it world that is fast, and it's all around us. Click a few buttons on your phone and People drop groceries into your trunk to take home today. Need a un new uniform for school or new clothes? Mom and dad will pay for it. You and I are so deep into this good life that our brains have kind of been hardwired for easy. And I think if you've been blessed like me and that kind of resonates with you, I don't blame you. You and I share our love for the easy life with pretty good company too though it's not just us here and now 21st century problems if the people who came face to face and lived with jesus at his time still struggled with the same thing maybe it's more than circumstance maybe we need god to get involved if we do want to go to jesus and we want to get all the good things that he wants to give us Maybe we need God here. So here's some good news. Let's level the playing field. Those people face to face with Jesus, they struggled pretty hard too. Because this is where Jesus kicks off. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man himself, he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. Can you imagine hearing that as one of Jesus' closest friends for the first time? This is the opposite of what the disciples had seen and heard and experienced with Jesus around. Jesus? He can't lose. Jesus has power and control over wind and waves and nature. Words that Jesus says like this, they don't even register with the disciples before they start to show themselves for who they are and what's inside of their hearts. Jesus spoke plainly about this. And Peter, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke Jesus. It's fair to critique because Jesus was not using a parable or a hidden thing with a hidden meaning. His words are as clear as they get. He's going to suffer, to be rejected, and to be killed, and Peter would not have it. Rebuking Jesus kind of seems crazy until you get into a really tough spot like Peter was in. How could Jesus say these things? How could the miracle worker have to face stuff like that? Peter, too, had been living the easy life with Jesus at his side. And now Jesus looked like the crazy one for saying life was going to be anything but easy like that. Yeah, they needed some help seeing reality face to face, too. So he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
This is part of what it means to come to Jesus. Everyone who wants Jesus has to pick up a cross and carry it behind them. Everyone who wants Jesus has something to lose so that they can hold on to the cross. Because a cross with Jesus, I promise you, it's not going to be small or simple or easy. It's heavy and it's painful. And it's going to feel like death on your back. Jesus promises that the easy life is not the way for those who want to follow behind him. And I think you and I can feel the sting of the words that he said to Peter, just like he would be saying it to us face to face. Because he turns to Peter and he says, you do not have the concerns of God but merely human concerns. For all the hours at work that you've spent making more money while neglecting family. For the times that you've failed to stand up for Christians when the group that you're in talked poorly about believers. For the hard conversations about sin that you need to have but aren't brave enough to start with somebody for the busyness in sports and friends and the school so that there's been no time left for devotional life in the Bible. All the things you've been blessed with in this world are amazing and awesome, but all of them can be ways to make your relationship with Jesus a little bit worse or finally non-existent anymore. Jesus isn't done with the tough words yet, though. Peter and the crowd around him, he made it as clear as possible. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? The truth is all the things of this world can do nothing for your soul. All the money you can imagine, the massive piles, can do nothing to help you when you face death. The house and the car and the boat and the vacations and the beach life, that can do nothing. To actually lift off the guilt and shame and the pain, you can try and work hard and struggle your whole life, but nothing in this world is going to be enough to do what you need to get done. You do that for some things in this life, though, don't you? You make your family food every day. You meal plan, you shop, you cook, you put it before them. It's not a small amount of effort. Maybe you are well known as the studier who studies and studies and studies and is absolutely prepared, has all the answers all the time, no problem, you've got it. Or like the, the gym shark t-shirts. I think a lot of you know who you are, the people that would wear those kinds of things. Those things, honestly, they can't even capture who you are because of the amount of sweat and time and energy that you've put into your body being healthy and being strong. You put everything you have into some things in this world because you've learned and you know that quick and easy, that doesn't work all the time. And that's why God knew that your soul needed something like that, too. But the good news is it wasn't you. It wasn't your best, your all. It was him, his all, his best. God takes your connection to Jesus so seriously that he was willing to give Jesus for you. It was the most important thing on God's to-do list throughout history, it's what Jesus chose to do when he knew what was coming and he kept going to his own cross. Even after saying it would end in his death. God loves forgiving you so much that he sent Jesus to win what you cannot possibly earn. And because he loves you here and now, but so much more in the forgiveness that is going to last forever after this too, nothing compares to Jesus. So now it actually kind of makes sense to leave everything else behind and follow him. 
But I think God knows that's easier said than done, especially if you have been making the worldly wrong choices for so long in life. I think you are going to need something big to push you to leave it for him. You're going to need motivation worth enough to make the hard choices that come from following behind Jesus. So here it is from both sides for you. If you don't leave it when you go to him, if you try to bring the things of this world with you and live for him, live for them, it's going to be bad. Even in this sin-messed-up world, you're going to feel the consequences of breaking his commands. Guilt and shame and pain will pile up so high that when the next big tragedy hits your life, they'll crush you. And it's not just going to be a few seconds of regret or pain. It could be forever. It could destroy your connection with God and the perfection that he has for you waiting in heaven. If you don't leave it, I promise you, awful things are coming for you. But if you do, if you leave it all for him, you and I will not be close to we cannot come close to appreciating how awesome it is to be connected to Jesus. You will have something solid to hold on to when the next tragedy hits. It'll hurt, but you're going to have somewhere to go with the hurt. The blessings that come from obedience to his commands will pour out into your life because you'll want to obey him for thanks for what his forgiveness means for you. The years and hours and moments struggling with guilt and pain and shame and regret will get lifted off of you. Every time you remember your baptism and what he's done for you, every time you hear how you are forgiven and adopted into his family, you can try to count it all up and write it all down, even for one day, and you're going to go to sleep that night wondering how God could be so good for you now in this world and how his goodness in Jesus is so much better than that. And the best news today is, he still invites you. Remember how all this started just a few weeks back? With a simple and beautiful and all-inclusive invite from Jesus to you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So bring the messiness, take the unlimited blessings, and leave the rest of the things of this world that might get in the way. Life with Jesus now and forever into eternity, I promise you, is going to be worth it. Amen.